What's up, family? How y'all doing? In the comment section, let us know how y'all doing. It's so good to have you all. Y'all, 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 y'all doing good. We see you, Quantana. We got a couple of people joining us. Cinti, listen, what's going on, Cinti, the Virgin Islands? I'm excited that you were able to join us. I know it's always difficult where you are, but we're so glad to have you. How y'all doing? Ayala, we know you're on the road, so we're praying with you. Uh, do me a favor, everybody who is here right now, go ahead and uh, share this with someone. I'm excited about this Bible study for those of us who have been committed. Um, if you're new and you know someone is new, we always have a playlist on our YouTube channel that will allow you to um, at least fill in some of the blanks. But each week that we gather, the goal is to be able to to stand alone. So even if this is your first time, you know, someone who wants to join, they can definitely join uh, Facebook, YouTube. We're so excited that you're here. Um, you have any prayer requests? We see you, Ohio. Um, Wendy, how you doing? Marcus Fent, we're good to see you. Listen, um, we want you to know uh, that we're praying for you. So if you have any prayer requests, please put them in the comment section. Uh, if you're catching this on replay, um, especially on YouTube, even if you add something in the comment section, we always get them. How y'all doing? How y'all feeling? Y'all feeling good? Um, I'm excited about the word on today. Um, me and my wife be debriefing and discussing particular revelations. And I'm excited because um, there's just some powerful things in the text for today. So um, we're going to, we've been, we've been, dealing with chapter nine of Acts and also chapter 22. Um, and the very first week we've dealt with waging war with the grace of God, waging war with God's grace. And, and are you really embracing the grace of God, right? And believe it or not, we know the name grace. We call our children grace. We say our grace before we eat. Uh, we sing amazing grace in songs. But when it comes to receiving and extending grace, it's one of the hardest things that we will ever be able to do. And um, I'm excited because we get to bring a couple of people on who will uh, join me in just a second, who will share a little bit about what has stood out to them. In the comment section, for those of you who uh, are able, uh, list one thing that stood out to you, whether it was last week, whether it was our uh, debrief on Saturdays, or even if it was the first week, what is something that stood out to you if you can communicate that in some shape, form, or fashion? Um, week one is waging war with the grace of God. And then last week we were dealing with, um, you know, what is your God story, right? Um, dealing with our God story, how to craft our God story and understanding um, the narrative around that. I won't go into it much. I'll allow the two um, people, uh, both uh, Rachel Hudson and Andrea uh, Romero to um, to bless us. Uh, some, uh, that was Rachel that said she wants to be a fly on the wall um, to kind of hear some of the things that my wife and I discuss. Um, I definitely appreciate her, her humility and um, just the things that God is, is doing. So if you're ready, um, I'm going to bring a couple of, of our friends, our family on but go to Acts chapter 10. I know I told you that we were going to deep dive into 21 and 22 in chapter 9, but actually God wants us to tune into chapter 10. Now, listen, somebody type in the comment section, the church has left the building. And before you go thinking about your brick and mortar, before you go and think about um, the name of that church that you perhaps want to crucify, uh, the church is never a building. The church is a people, right? Uh, so it's just a play on words, but we are the church. But uh, today we're going to talk from the subject, the church has left the building. I know what we're going to talk about. We entitled it something different, but there's something powerful. There's a powerful thread throughout our study that I need to kind of lay at your feet because I'm willing to bet 90% of us are not going to encounter the nuances of what we're dealing with today in your respective religious spaces or spiritual spaces. So we, we thank God for the opportunity to be able to hear this and be exposed to this day. But for a moment, let's bring in a couple of our family to join us. And we pray that we're able to hear them. Last week, we couldn't hear well, 
And so we're going to give it another try to see if we can bring a couple of people in and see if we can hear you. Andrea, can we hear you? Uh, can you hear me? I don't know. Can you hear me? Absolutely. <laughs> can we hear you? Yes. I hopefully. Praise yep, the Lord. You're good. Right, so we we got we got exactly what we need to do. So next week we want about five of you all to join us um, just to do some you know some playback. So you all were here perhaps last week or you got a chance to catch it on replay. What is something perhaps up until this point that stood out? What is one thing that stood out to you that perhaps can help someone else? All right. Who's going first? <laughs> you got it. You go. All right. So for me, um, I think my biggest revelation was how the memory actually can impact your story. And so for me, I think a lot of the times I figured my story wasn't really worthy of telling. There's so many people that have better testimony, like the testimony of Saul. They go through some stuff. And um, when you start peeling back the layers, you start realizing that there's some stuff there that you're going to have to tap into in order to get your story out. Yeah. And that's really what stood out for me. So I've been doing a lot of um, studying and trying to figure out how I'm going to package my story. It's also been revealed to me that who you think your story is not for, because technically they were a part of that story, um, that might be your audience. Mm -hmm. That might be your audience. I think we're going to look. At, I think we're going to look at a bit of that today because everybody who is who can hear me right now, your story is for prob is probably for who you think it's not. You know, and I think that we, that's the the thing that kind of was an obstacle for the early church, for the church in the early time, and even for us today, is that they thought it was for the people who made them comfortable, the people that they knew. And that's why if God, if Jesus gave the commandment in Acts chapter one, 10 and 20 years later, they were still not fulfilling that commandment. We'll talk about that today, um, but that's good. Don't allow your memory to become your master. Your memory is one of the greatest things that can keep you from packaging your God story. You forgot what God did for you. Mm -hmm. Somebody type that. Um, it's easy to forget what God did for you. And that's why in scripture, one of the things that God always tells the people is don't forget. Or he would say, remember, remember, because it's easy for us to forget what God did for us. Rachel, talk to us. Thank uh, you. So, thank you so much, Amanda. So um, for mine, I just got back a couple weeks ago from a uh, post-abortive healing retreat and it was healing that I didn't know that I needed because I'm nine years um, post-abortive now and um, it was actually for my job since uh, one of my jobs is to manage a um, pregnancy care center and um, while I was there it was just it blew my mind because similarly like I haven't changed I don't even know if that's a word but I haven't shared some of my testimony just because I didn't think it was important or like who am I like yeah I made it through some stuff but I'm just your average working mom but your your testimony is so powerful and um while I was there and it was with a, a everyone was catholic everyone that participated and everybody that was there to volunteer and um I was just shocked at how much my testimony touched people and the opportunity that I had to share the opportunity um, that I had to minister to even a woman that was old enough to be my grandmother. And it was just mind boggling um, how God will use you. And I'll even say another thing in part of it, they wanted us to share our testimony and they had a couple questions to help us like um, organize it. And I realized at the end that I had left out after I was done, I was like, oh, can I have like 60 more seconds? Because I left out um, my best friend's suicide in 2016. It just wasn't in my mind at that time because of what we were there for. And I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit moved me and brought that back to remembrance because two of the participants um, were touched by suicide. I know, I think both of them, I know one for sure had tried to commit suicide. And um, I believe the other one as well. But it was just like, what, what if we hadn't shared that and hadn't talked about it? So even last week, as you were talking about um, questions to ask and ways to package it and that, you know, it's going to change depending on your audience. It was just so powerful. And it was confirmation. Your audience. We talked last week about your audience matters. Somebody type your audience matters. Um, but what will happen is you don't get to determine who asks you to share your story. Mm -hmm. And one of the worst things you can do is arrive to a place you know, 
not prepared to share mm -hmm. what God has done for you. And then you get to reaching and then you miss important things. Someone needs to know your story matters. Yeah. And I know, Andrea, you said Saturday, you was like, you didn't feel like your story was, you know, finished or like you didn't, it, it, it's, you know, I, I'm, your story even now matters. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I think one thing I was never taught was that my story is a part of the gospel. My story is the gospel. Amen. And if I share with people what God did for me, I am effectively mm -hmm. being a witness for him. Yeah. And the greatest purpose that God has given each of us is to first be a witness to him before we want to do anything else. If there is a question about who you are, what you need to do, the first thing you need to know is you have a responsibility to be a witness. You have a responsibility to make disciples. And when yeah. we hear that, it's like we don't, we start to close our ears because it's boring. But truth of the matter is everyone has someone who they can impact. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank y'all for your time. And I appreciate you. We appreciate you all. Let, let yeah. us know. Let them know how you feel about them. Thank y'all so much. Everybody, let's thank them for their time. We want to jump into Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, everybody. Um, you know what? I'm going to have some people on here to help me read this, this, this passage because, or not this passage, but moving forward. Uh, but if there's something you need to know, you need to know that your, your story matters and that your power is connected to, your, to what God has done for you. And until you arrive to a place that you're willing and able to remember and willing to talk, you could be holding up your own cure. You could be holding up your own fulfillment. Um, so let's do it this way. So we know that, um, Acts chapter one, verse eight, verse four and verse eight are absolutely, um, uh, impactful because this, they follow us. It follows us everywhere we go. Acts chapter one, verse four, Jesus makes reference to the disciples that, Hey, y'all, we're gathering together. I need you all to go and wait for your power. You know, the conversation we had about the Holy Spirit, make reference back to that conversation. I'm paraphrasing. In verse four of chapter one, he reminds them of a conversation they had previously about the Holy Spirit. That conversation is, takes place in John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, he talks and he prepares them about the Holy Spirit, but he talks to them about the importance of love, right? You can't do anything about uh, without abiding in my love, and you can't abide in my love unless you abide in me. And if you're going to abide in my love, you need to love others as you love yourself and you, and you love me. You can't love others if you don't love uh, yourself. You can't love others if you don't love me. Everything is interwoven. So he's telling them that they need to abide in his love before there's ever any power. In verse eight of chapter one of Acts, and this is important because of where we're going, he tells them again, he tells them something. He says, all right, now, when the Holy Spirit comes, I need you all to go to some places and I need you all to be a witness for me. The places required them to leave Jerusalem. It required them to leave the place that was familiar to them and to go to some places that were unfamiliar, starting with Judea, then Samaria. Samaria was going to be a hard place for them to go because it consisted of people who they didn't agree nor liked. And if you're talking about going to the ends of the world, then you're now going to a place where people who don't believe and don't look like you. Here is the problem, everybody. Jesus gives them that commandment in Acts chapter one. That is a commandment. He commissions them, right? And we went through our first part of our Bible study through all of the chapters, the first five, six, seven, eight chapters, only to discover when we arrive at chapter 10, everybody say 10 years, 10 years, 10 years. 
When we arrive at chapter 10, it's now 10 years after Jesus gave them that commission, after the, the Pentecost took place. What we have been studying is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul went from being a racist to a gracist. Everybody with me? You don't have to believe me. You don't have to like the word racist. You don't have to believe what I'm saying. But if you look at the text and you study who Paul is, he went from hating people, certain tribes. He went from hating the church and hating anybody connected to the church, primarily the Jews, killing them, to now being a proponent of talking about the word grace. We can't avoid, nor can we get away from the word grace. Everybody type grace, write it in your book, write it in your book, because God is about to do something different in your life that's centered around the word grace. There is a level in him. And me and my wife are talking. You know, we talk about spiritual growth. We talk about levels. It's not about levels. It's about closeness and proximity to him. And some of us can't get to a certain proximity or closeness to God because we can't wrap our hands or our minds around grace. Not levels, proximity, closeness. And so the thing that's probably keeping you unfulfilled, unhappy, going in circles is because just like the people in the text, you want to do it the way you want to do it. And you think that you're absolutely right. And the Holy Spirit is trying to say something else to you, but you're convinced you got it figured out. Somebody say the church. I want to share something with you in Acts chapter 10, and you, got, you all got to walk with me. Now, again, Acts chapter 9, Paul experiences a transformation. He goes from killing people in the church to now he's telling people in the church and around the church that God wants to introduce something to you and that something is called grace. As a matter of fact, it's shown by our ability to love people who we are, are taught to hate. And the moment that he starts talking about this grace, even your spirit filled believers disagree and want to kill him. You can be saved. You can be spirit filled. You can experience demonstrations in your life. Miracle signs and wonders and still be mean, still be racist, still be bigoted, and still be prideful, still be blind. Because the goal, I'm going to say this again, but I'm going to say this for the first time now. The goal isn't the gifts. Somebody say the goal isn't the gifts. Your goal in life isn't the gifts, spiritual gifts. Your goal isn't speaking in tongues. Your goal isn't miracles, signs, and wonders. Your goal isn't increasing membership of the church by numbers. Your goal is none of your goals isn't God give me a vision, give me a sign. Your goal isn't God speak to me. That's not the goal. Your goal, let me help you. Let me help you. Your goal is obedience. Somebody need someone needs to shout that in your house. Obedience. I'm shifting and I'm helping someone. Your goal. Somebody needs this message. So you need you need to shift this. You need to you need to share this. You need to share this. Watch this. Your goal in life. Now, we're going to get this in chapter 10 because I'm setting you up. I'm setting it up. Your goal is not a six figure salary. Your goal isn't a split love a home. Your goal isn't marriage and children. Your goal isn't the promotion. Your goal is your goal is obedience. That is your singular goal. Obedience, watch this. Obedience is God's love language. And until you understand this, you can be holding up your own your own elevation, your own, your own uh, fulfillment. You can be holding up again, your own cure, your own answer. Obedience is God's love language. You can't manufacture obedience. 
You can't copycat obedience. God has an assignment on your life. And I don't care how much you want something to be new, to feel different, to make you do this. At the end of the day, God has given you an assignment. And the only way you get closer, the only way you get to the next season uh, effectively, the only way you get more is through obedience. I need somebody to hear this. God gave the church an assignment. And when I say church, I'm talking about us. He gave the church an assignment in Acts chapter one. And this is where people got messed up because throughout the first 10 chapters, it says, and the church was multiplied and people were added to the church. Some people get content because in Acts chapter two, the Bible says that when this Holy Spirit fell, so many people got saved on the first day. Yeah, Peter, he, he preached and so many people got saved on the first day and everybody's like, yeah, we're doing the will of the Lord. But guess what? Just because those many those many people get saved on day one, the, the, the assignment is still not fulfilled. Because all of those people who got saved on day one were not me and you. They were not from our tribe. They were not of our race, our ethnicity. They were not from our demographics. All those were Jews. And so, therefore, sometimes we can see an increase in numbers, an increase in money, an increase in promotion, and even some answered prayers. And we think that we've arrived. We think that we fulfilled. Jesus said, I need you to go to Judea, Samaria, and the end of the world. You're going to read in the text that they went everywhere else. This is important because now Paul has arrived. And after Paul arrived, a Paul, be Paul began to let everybody know that there is something called grace. God wants to love and he wants to bring people into relationship with him who are not Jews. When he stepped to the scene to begin to open up heaven for me and you, the church didn't like it. J Jews who were converted didn't like it. People did not like it. So now after about a year, Peter, he knows what Paul said, but what if I told you, y'all with me? Are y'all with me? Y'all with me? What if I told you as much as we follow Peter, as much as we love Peter, as much as we talk about Peter, as much as he, you know, made mistakes, he walked on water, as much as he preached a day of Pentecost and so many people got saved, as though we hear so much about Peter, but what if I told you that Peter was a racist? I know somebody wants to disagree. Somebody wants to disengage. I'm not talking about white or black. Watch this. What if I told you that Peter was a bigot? What if I told you that Peter did not want the gospel to be shared with anybody other than a Jew? And by any means necessary, he would see to that, that that would happen. Because you can be saved and still have blind spots. Somebody say this. Somebody say, you can have power and still have blind spots. You can you can have power and still need to mature and evolve. You can be powerful and still not give God access to certain parts of your heart and certain certain parts of your life. So power isn't the end game. I don't want to be powerful and blind. I don't want to have all the gifts of the spirit, but yet I still have not evolved. And so what if I told, but see, I'm not just going to tell you this and then just say, y'all have a good day. I'm going to show you scripture because it is possible that even in our lives today, even in our spaces today, even in our circles today, that there are some implicit biases. There are some things, there's some, there's, there's heart transplants and surgery spiritually that needs to occur. There's some things in your heart that is keeping you and will keep you from fulfillment because you're going to watch this. Paul, no, Cornelius, somebody type Cornelius, who is a pagan, a Roman officer, he's going to eventually get saved. And you want to know why? Is because Paul is going to be connected to his destiny.
I mean, Peter, Peter, Peter is going. Now, now watch this, though. But before their encounter, Peter wouldn't have believed that. Now, let's read this. I want to walk this down with you. Can I, can, I, can I walk this down with you? This is important because nobody, not many people are going to teach this to you and provide this for you. So you get to sit back right in your notes because I promise you, just like Peter, who only wanted the gospel to be preached to one particular people group, one particular tribe, he eventually evolved. Somebody says, you can change. I know culture says you can't change. He'll never change. You never change. But Peter evolves and allows God to transform certain parts of his heart because you can go to church, you can serve in ministry and still need God to work on you. Doing for God is not the same as being with God. And so God needs to, to encounter Peter because God said, Peter, you're doing the work, but you're still missing the mark. I don't want you. I'm talking to somebody just working for church, just working on that job. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, you're making impact, but you're not making the total impact that God wants you to make. So look, 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 look. All right. Watch this. Verse one. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. Everybody get that? He was a centurion of what was called uh, the Italian regiment which means that he was responsible for 600 men. He was the leader of 600 men. And it says he was a devout man. Watch this. Don't miss this. He was a devout man and one who feared God with all his household. So it says that everyone in his household was God fearing and devout just like him. But I want you to notice something. The text never says he was a Jew, nor does the text says he was a believer or Christian. <laughs> Watch this. Watch this. And you want to know, he 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 needed Peter just like somebody needs you. Someone who you don't think needs you. The Bible says he was devout. The Bible says that he feared God and his household. And the Bible says he gave alms generously to the people and he prayed to God always. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. I'm going to talk about this a whole nother day. But the Bible says he was generous. And something about his generosity got God's attention. We're going to see later on, not in this Bible study, <laughs> we're not talking about tithes and offering. We're talking about generosity. Tithes and offering is so Old Testament, but generosity is New Testament. So it's, not the, the, it's his generosity. He didn't say because he was, he, was, he was paying tithes. He was generous. He was generous with his life. And watch this. And the Bible says one afternoon, three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw the angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel of God said, and when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And this, this is what the angel of the Lord said. Your prayers and your alms came up for a memorial before God. Watch this. Don't disconnect. He's, the angel says, your generosity caught God's attention. And God remembers your generosity. Don't somebody's life will be transformed with this particular word today. Don't don't disconnect. The text says that he, the angel, or the angel says to to Cornelius, your generosity caught God's attention. Now what? Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, who is Peter, y'all, who is Peter. All right. Watch this. Send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. So there's two Simons. One is Peter. One is a tanner. And he says, I need you to send men to go and get Peter. Everybody type Peter. Watch this. And when you send men to get Peter, Peter is going to tell you exactly what to do. Watch this, because there's something still that he needs to do because he, 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 he hasn't fully become a believer. So he said, there's some things you need to do. And he says, and when the angel spoke and, to, and departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a soldier and he wait, who waited on him. And then he told them everything that had happened. Verse nine, everybody with me. Verse nine, watch this. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray. Right. Peter went on the housetop to pray and then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while he, they made 
they they made ready, he fell into a trance. The same word that that it talks about in Genesis when God put Adam to sleep, this is the same word. He falls into a deep sleep. He falls into a trance and he saw the heaven open up. Now I want to explain something to some people who probably have read past this and have never really understood what this meant. Now, all this is important because this is about you. This is about the Gentiles. This is after God already revealed his greatest mission to the worst person in, in Paul. Now he's trying to convince Peter, right? So God does, two, he does one thing to two people. At the same time, he's talking to both Peter and he's talking to Cornelius. He's talking to the both of them at the same time. While you're trying to work it out, God already figured it out. And so the Bible says that God calls Peter to go to sleep. And then he gave him a vision. Now watch this vision so I can help somebody. Don't miss this. He saw the heaven open up and a sheet bound by four corners came down and fell on earth. Inside of this sheet, this sheet, were all kinds of four-footed animals, wild beasts, creepy things, birds of the air, and a voice came. So imagine all of the animals, the beast, and the fowl of the air that that Adam, you know, were able to name, all these things come down in this vision. And so there is this sheet and inside of this sheet are so many different animals that God created. Now I'm going somewhere with this. Now, this is what happens. God tells him, Peter, get up, kill these animals and go ahead and eat. But here's the problem. Peter is so stuck in his tradition, somebody type tradition. Peter is so stuck in the past that he put God in a box and God fits in his nice little box and God, this is how God works. This is how God speaks. This is what God is. God is nothing more than this God in the box. Some of us have God in our box, in our black box, in our white box, in our rich box, in our poor box, in our angry box, in our joyful box, in our limited box. We get God in a box, right? And God can't come out of that box because you created this image of who God is and God is this particular God. And the reason why you're so depressed and so anxious and so disappointed is because you created this image of who God is. And God is so much more than that. God never told you this is all of who he is. And so God is trying to come to Peter because Peter is tunnel vision and Peter is missing the assignment. Peter, I told you all to go to Judea, Samaria and the ends of the world. And all you all are doing is going to the Jews. That is not what I said. I gave you a big vision and you're still living in your comfort and what makes sense. And so how often in our lives do we prefer to do what we know and what we feel comfortable with doing and what sounds good because we don't want to be uncomfortable. And so God tells him to do something that's hard. Why is it hard? Let me explain to you. God tells him, I want you to get up and I want you to kill these animals and I want you to begin to eat. Huh? Hold on, God. I am not going to do that. These animals are unclean. Alone. Now watch this. God tells him to, to kill the animals and eat it. And he says, God, according to Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14, these animals are unclean. No, we're not supposed to eat these animals because you told us if they don't chew their cud and if their feet, if their feet are not separated totally, God, I, I, no, if their hooves are not fully cloven, then we cannot. Let me, I'm gonna, let me make it. Let me break it down to you. And it were all kinds of four animals. He said, rise and eat. But Peter said, no, not so, Lord, for I have I have never eaten anything common or unclean. I'm perfect. I don't get in sin. I don't mess up, God. And I'm not going to do so now because I'm perfect. I, 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 I've never eaten anything unclean. And that's why I'm powerful. That's why you use me, because I've never eaten anything unclean. And God said, hold on. What God has cleansed. You must never call unclean. He's going somewhere. He's saying, you need to take God out that box that you have him in. And I'm talking to somebody right now. You need to take God out that box. This is what the angel says to him. Hold on. First of all, you ain't got to quote scripture to God. I created scripture. And the problem is you missed the movement. 
because what I'm doing is beyond your understanding. And I'm trying to reach a people that's beyond the Jews. But you still only want to talk to, eat with, sup with, and have friendships with Jews when there's an entire world out there that needs you. Watch this. And the voice spoke again and said, what, what you must, what God has cleansed, you must not call in common. <laughs> Can I help y'all? All right. So somebody asked the question. Somebody asked the question. Somebody asked the question. Um, I had written it down somewhere, but I probably won't. So I think that when you look, somebody, somebody might have time. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 14. So I want, I want to walk this down for you because you probably won't have someone walk it down for you. So in Leviticus for your homework, Leviticus chapter 11 verses 1 through 47, and Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 3 to 20. I'm going to read just a little bit from Deuteronomy chapter 14. I'm going to explain to you as why Peter was like, nah, I'm not going to eat that food because you don't realize that God was trying to open his mind and trying to transform and trying to get to the heart of matters because he saw inside of that palette of animals a lot of animals, according to the Old Testament, that were unclean. And so when you look, you'll read Leviticus, you'll get a list as into why they're unclean, right? And so um, it will tell you a few different things. But one of the things it says, don't eat any animal that doesn't chew the cud or doesn't have a fully split hoof foot that's fully that's fully split you're like why but it gives a list of all these that because when you think about animals that chew the cud and it's not an animal chewing another animal it's literally an animal that does not chew so a cud means food that has gone down to your stomach to your digestive system but comes back up so that you can chew it a second time i know it sounds gross but there's animals and if they don't do that, you can't eat them because those animals are considered unclean. This is Old Testament talk now. In the Old Testament, the reason why they couldn't eat certain animals, because if an animal, according to its digestive system, when it eats food, the first part of its stomach will bring that food back up at a later time so that that animal can keep chewing it to make sure that it's processed correctly. And so if an animal doesn't do that, you can't eat it because... The way that the understanding is, if an animal does that, then that animal likely will be healthier because it takes its time to chew its food, right? And likely the animals that chew the cud, I know I'm going a little far. The reason why it's important is because they can eat different types of grass that humans can't eat. They can eat certain things that humans can't eat and they can process it. So therefore, they don't compete with humans for nutrition. And that's one reason why they're considered clean, because they never have to compete with humanity for what they need to eat. They can eat what we can't eat. That's why it's important. And splitting the hooves are, you know, like a, a, um, a particular a sheep or someone is because now when their hooves are split, it means that they can walk on particular grounds that have not been cultivated in our rough so that they can go up hills. They can go into mountains, places where they have not been tilled by man in our rough. They can go there and find food in different places. So they're considered clean because they can eat other things. You didn't ask for that, but I needed to give it to you. Now, that's is why some things are good. Some things are healthy or permissible, cer ceremony clean, and some things are unclean. Now, Look in Deuteronomy, you must not, in, in, in verse three, you must not eat anything detestable, any detestable animals that are unclean. These are the animals you may eat, ox, sheep, goat, deer, gazelle, deer, wild, you know, wild goat, antelope. You may not eat any animal that, uh, that has, you may eat any animal that has completely split hooves and chews the cud. That's what I wanted to give that to you before you read that so you know what that means. But if the animal does not have both, it may not be eaten. So you may not eat a camel, a hare, badger. You know, they chew the cud, but they don't have hooves that are split. You can read that on, on another time for your own self. So come back. So so Peter is having a conversation with God saying, God, 
I'm keeping scripture. Old Testament, might I speak. I, I don't I don't do anything wrong. I don't eat anything that I'm not supposed to eat. And God says, if I make it clean, you can't come back and say it's unclean. And God was going somewhere with this. And so look at this. Everybody go to verse 16 of chapter 10 of the book of Acts. Watch this. Watch this. Do not miss this. Somebody share this with somebody. You need this. They go. They need this word right here, right here. They need this word right here. The Bible says this was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. <laughs> Y'all missed it. I'm going to read this again. Do I have another translation? The same vision was repeated. This is New Living Translation now for those of you who need something that reads a little different. This vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Y'all, oh, y'all missing it. God came down into a vision to talk to Peter and to share with Peter, Peter, you're not fulfilling my assignment because you're only sharing it with people who are in the same class as you, people who are the same race as you, people who look like you, think like you, agree with you and live where you live. Peter, that's not what I told you all to do. There's people who need to hear your word, people who need to hear your story, who don't look like you, who don't agree with you, who might be a Democrat, who might be a Republican, who might come from a different city, a different state, might be a foreigner, might be an immigrant, but they need your story. Now watch this. <laughs> Peter, his heart is so hard in a certain aspect of his life that it took God to come down in three separate visions before Peter could get it. That scripture, I'm not making this up. God had to show up. God, now look, the vision, supernatural. You see the angel, you hear the angel, you are in a train, you see all of this and it has to happen. Not one. Here, here you go, here you go, here you go. Here goes somebody right now. Somebody said, all I need is God to give me a sign. Lie. All I need is God to show, give me a vision like you gave Daniel. Lie. You think you need what you need. And here it is. You get it. And yeah, you need it again. God came to him. Not one, not twice, but three times. This was done three times before Peter said, okay. What's keeping you? from being obedient. Watch this. I think this was the most powerful in my private time, and I don't want you all to miss this. God showed up, and God needed to shift his paradigm. You're caught in the Old Testament. Did I not come to you, and did I not fulfill the Old Testament? The law... It's just a guide. It's not a rule book for you anymore. I'm relieving you of that. There's something called grace that you heard from Paul, but obviously you don't want to believe in it because you think it's still about your works. I'm talking to somebody. This was done three times. When I saw that and the Lord revealed it to me because somebody read past it. God had to come to him. Peter, Peter now, Peter. He had to come to him three times and speak the same thing. Peter, what I say is unclean. You can't, what I say is clean. You can't say it's unclean, Peter. Peter, what I say is clean. You can't say it's unclean. Peter, go to sleep again. I'm going to come to you again in the vision. I'm going to say the same thing. And then watch this in verse 17. Peter was very perplexed. After three, three encounters, Peter still perplexed. I just want to throw the book. I just want to throw the book. Peter. Peter was very perplexed. This is after. What could the vision mean? Y'all don't tell me y'all need God to show up. Don't tell me y'all need God to tell you something. No, look, because sometimes the answer you need is connected to someone who you think you don't need. The answer you're looking for is connected to someone who you think you don't need. I don't need Cornelius. He's a pagan. He's a Roman. He's not a Jew. He's a Roman officer. I don't need him. 
Peter was perplexed. What could this vision mean? Just as he was asking this question, men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if the man named Simon Peter was here. See, while Simon was having the vision, you know, Cornelius was sending the people. God had sent the people when Simon was having the vision while you're praying and while you're toiling. God already sent the answer, but you could be holding up the cure. You could be holding up the answer. The answer can be at your gate right now. The answer can be at your gate, but you're still stuck on yourself. The answer can be at your gate right now, literally at your mailbox right now. The answer can be there. The Bible says the men were there at the gate standing outside. Peter was still inside perplexed. What could this vision mean? And then look, 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 look. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit had to come back to him and say, three men have come looking for you. Get up, please go downstairs and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry. I sent them. Is this moving anybody? All right, all right, all right, all right. Now, 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 you just get this, get this. There's so much I wanted to talk about, man. All right, so then Peter goes downstairs and he said, and Satir, Cornelius is turning a just man who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by the Holy Spirit, you know, an angel to summon you to this house and hear the words. Then he invited them in and lodged with them. This is important because you don't lodge with anybody who's not a Jew. And the next day, Peter went away with him and some brethren to Joppa. I'm going to try to fast forward this. So they're having a conversation. Peter says in verse 28, you know, I'm not supposed to be eating with you now. And he says something else. He says, but God has shown me everybody with me. God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. I'm releasing somebody right now. You know, it's unlawful for a Jewish man to keep company or go with another person from another nation. He says, you know, it's uncommon for a Jewish man to have company with someone of another tribe, someone who is a foreigner, someone who is not a Jew. And I have been preaching the gospel for years to only Jews, only people from my own tribe, only people who look like me. You know, it's unlawful. Now, I'm, you're going to say, well, that has nothing to do with me. I'm not racist. I'm black. or I'm not racist. I'm white. I get, I, mm -mm -mm. You're missing it. Watch this. It says, therefore, I came with that objection. So Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting. And he says, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayers had been answered. Your alms remembered. And so when Peter saw all of this, the Bible teaches in verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I discern and perceive that God shows no partiality to no man. And in every nation, whoever fears and works righteousness is accepted by him. Here is the transformation, y'all. This is the message in verse 36. This is the message and the good news in the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Right. So he's he's beginning. To tell Cornelius. I get it. Everybody, somebody say grace. Everybody deserves. Everybody has access to the gospel. I'll say it like that. None of us deserve the gospel. And the reason why I'm, I'm sharing that with you is because in the latter part of chapter 10, that's when the Gentiles, for the first time, the Holy Spirit descends upon all of them. So it's said that Cornelius is considered the first Gentile convert, but Peter had to be transformed. And I needed to share that with you because it's important for us to see that you can be in the church and still have blind spots. You could be in the church, you can have power and still need to grow in certain areas of your life. But the church has left the building. Peter didn't want that, but watch this. When you look at chapter 11, of the book of Acts, verse one. Now the apostles and brothers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles received the word of God. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those you know they who were with him, they, they said, you went in to uncircumcised men and you ate with them. They criticized 
the Jewish believers criticized Peter because he shared the gospel with somebody other than Jews. Somebody say the church has left the building. I want to go there because even there, and I think it was in Acts chapter 14. I don't know if I get a chance to get to 29 like I really wanted to. Um, yeah, 20. Go to Acts chapter 21. Let me just go there. Let me go there. It's important that I go there. I use my time wisely. Acts chapter 21. How about we do that? Acts chapter 21. All right. Now, so in Acts chapter 21, let me read a couple of verses, verses 26 to 36 for you. Now, let me read this. Let me read this. Let me read this. Why am I reading this? Because we've been talking about God's story. We've been talking about waging war with grace. We've been talking about trying to embrace the grace of God. And we look at this text and we see how the early church couldn't get right. Ten years after Pentecost, Peter was still unwilling to love on people who didn't look like him. Peter is now transformed. Acts chapter 21 is at least 21 years after Pentecost, at least 11 years after Peter's encounter. And I want you to see that the church still has an issue with people who are different than them. So in verse 26, this is Paul. Then Paul took the men and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple. Somebody say the church to announce the expiration of the Jews and the purification at that time. Offering could be made each one of them in verse 27. Now, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, the Jews from Asia, the Jews from Asia, seeing Paul in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and then they laid hands. They didn't lay hands to pray. They lay hands to beat. They lay hands on him crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere, because Paul is doing what God called him to do. He's teaching all men everywhere, right, against the people, the law, and in and, and this place. And watch what it says. And furthermore, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. The Jews, let's, say, let's, say, let's paraphrase it this way. The church, the people of the church is upset because Paul invited someone into the sanctuary who they feel didn't belong or didn't deserve to be in the sanctuary. I want you to, I want to sit that with you. But who was this person? This person, verse 29, for they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesians. Somebody say the book of Ephesians, type the book of Ephesians. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian with them in the city whom they suppose that Paul had brought into the temple and they and all the city was disturbed and the people ran together to seize Paul and to drag him out the church and immediately the doors were short because the church became an unsafe place for Trophimus and for Paul because Paul dared bring somebody into the church who they felt didn't belong into the church. When did the church become a place where people belong there? and deserve to be there. And so they said, these people don't belong in the church. The church is a place for people who don't belong and who don't deserve to be there. But they said there is an Ephesian believer because what we don't realize is the entire book of Ephesians, we'll talk about Saturday, the entire book of Ephesians is written to a, gen a predominantly Gentile congregation. So while people are still fighting over who should get the gospel, Paul was creating churches in, in Ephesus. And so he's bringing with him a believer from Ephesus who is now in the temple and they're trying to worship God. But the people of the church are saying, you know what? They got too many tattoos. You know what? I know where they've been. You know what? They had an abortion. You know what? I heard that they are gay or homosexual. You know what? I, I, I heard about their parents. You know what? I seen and heard about what they did last night. They don't deserve to be here in the uh, uh, that's a homosexual that that transgender they don't deserve to be in the church when did the church i talk myself yeah i said it i said it when did the church become that that's a, that's an immigrant illegally 
I know that that person drinks a lot. That person, they have marital problems. That person, I, I heard they be going to the club. That person, I, 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 that person is single and had three children. Can you believe that? That person, I, I think he had, he was unfaithful with his wife. He shouldn't be him. And he gonna come into the churches, come to churches, play in church. They just play in church. The entire city. Y'all ain't got to like the message. You ain't got to like the message. The entire city became, was in an uproar because some people were in the church who they didn't think deserved to be in the church. And they got to a point. Now, one last thing I'm going to show you. We're going to go back to chapter 22. Now I want to show you in chapter 22 what's powerful. We did all that to get here. Somebody say the church has left the building. They, the Bible says in chapter 21 that they wanted to kill. They said, away with him, kill him. Why do you want to kill Paul? Because he's sharing the gospel with people who are not like us. What comes to your mind? Everybody with me? What comes to your mind when you hear the word homeless? A homeless man. What comes to your mind? Homeless man. What comes to your mind? We think about a homeless man. What comes to your mind when I say the word transgender? What comes to mind? What about don't you get to type? Just 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 think this thing for me. Begging for alms. Drug dealer, ex-convict, pimp, immigrant. What comes to mind when you hear this? It's a good chance that we all, including myself, have biases that we don't realize we have that's keeping us from doing what Jesus told the disciples in John chapter 15. I need you to love everybody like you love yourself because the gifts and the power that I'm going to give you is for the people of God, not for yourself. And you can't fully fulfill the calling on your life if you don't walk in love. And so he's trying to teach Peter in 10 that, Peter, yes, you're doing a lot, but there's a lot you're not doing because you still need to love everybody. And so that person who is still in prison, that person who, who committed the most egregious crime, think about that person. And so Peter and Paul and the, or not Paul, but Peter and people in the church, they're saying away with him. They don't deserve grace. Now watch this in chapter 22 and I'm going to bid y'all a good evening. Watch this. Verse 17. We've read this before, but I want to read a little part of this. Paul is giving his God story to the mob who is beating him. And he's regurgitating what God did for him. And as he's explaining his conversation with God and what God told him, I want you to see what happens. The Bible said they were quiet and they were paying attention to him as he spoke. But then as he was talking, he says, now it happened in verse 17. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I came into a trance and, 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 and saw him saying to me, make haste, get out of Jerusalem. This is God talking to, to Paul. For they would not receive your testimony. They won't receive your God story of me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe in you. And they and when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was there standing by consenting his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then God said this. This is what God said to, to Paul. Then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. This is God talking to Paul, but he's telling all of the mob what's happening or what happened. And then this is what happened. And if you read your verse, if you read your Bible, this is what it says. And they listened to him until this word. The Bible says the crowd listened until Paul said that word. And, and they listened until this word. And then they raised their voices saying, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he's not fit to live. The Bible says that they began to shout away su with such a fellow. He isn't fit to live. They yelled through their coats and tossed handful of dust in the air. Everything was cool until he said grace. Everything was okay until he said, God told me that he gonna send me away to the Gentiles. 
to share with them the gospel message of grace. And the very moment that he said that, all of the people who believe in God, all of the God-fearing people who go to church and worship, all of the people who keep the law, all of the people who pray to the Lord, we need to kill him. The church has left the building. They didn't want the gospel to be shared with other people. There could be that there is something keeping you from loving other people. Think about Cornelius. We all have a Cornelius in our lives and in our pathway. Someone who is far from us, someone who does not look like us, someone who doesn't live where we live, someone who doesn't speak the language we speak or have the same culture or, 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 or just, just think the way that their future is dependent on your obedience. There was one point in this message, only one point. God's love language is obedience. What, I can ask you what has God told you to do, but I'm telling you what God has told you to do. God says he wants you to be a witness. That's the great commandment or the great commission. And the great commandment is I want you to love me with all your heart and mind and soul and love others as you love yourself. That's the great commandment. There's nothing else you need to do. If you do what you know to do, that is be a witness, share your gospel, and it could be that you need God to transform parts of your heart because that person who is homeless may not need the gospel. They just need your, your love. They just need your, 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 your compassion. The person who you think is far from you, Cornelius, Peter, is the person who needs you so they can be who God has called them to be. The church may have left the building, but you, me, the church has a mission. That's a share with as many people as possible what God has done for us. You don't have to know scripture. You don't have to know the Bible inside and out. You don't have to be perfect. And what Peter said to the church in chapter 11, he says, who God called clean, who am I to say they're unclean? You don't get to determine who deserves grace, period. If God says they deserve grace and he wants them to have grace, then they deserve grace. Come on, y'all. What you got in the comment section? What you got in the comment section? Let me, let me hear you. Let me hear you. Yes. Um, listen, I appreciate you all. Thank you all for tuning in. We see you on Facebook and YouTube. I'm prayerful that um, this message has been uh, impactful in some way. Um, you don't need a whole lot. Last week, I gave you a whole lot of points and a whole lot of things to write down. A lot of people weren't able to write them down today. There's a lot of things that you may desire. Your end goal is not what you think it is. Your end goal is obedience. And you don't need to ask me for a one-on-one -on -one private coaching session to walk down your purpose in life and who God has called you to be because when you fulfill the great commission and you begin to lean into the great commandment, everything else becomes even clear. Nothing else matters if the great commission and the great commandment are not a part of your life. Great commission, go into all the world. Your world might be your neighborhood. Your world might be your job. Your world might be the post office. But believe it or not, no matter your race, whether you're white, black, Latino, Asian, um, no matter where you are, who you are, you can have biases. You can be biased about a lot of things. You can be prejudiced about a lot of things. 
You could be racist about a lot of things. You can have limitations and blind spots about a lot of things. You don't have to be mean and be bigoted. You could just not know it. Or you can. But just because you go to church doesn't mean you're not any of those things, Peter, and the rest of the people in the church. It's possible to be in the church and still not give God full access to your heart to transform. You don't want to do anything if it's not done in love and through love, not your love, but God's love through you. Lord, we bless you and God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this message. We pray, God, that it falls upon good ground, that it falls upon fertile soil, and that, God, this word is shared to who needs to hear it. Teach us how to move beyond our comfort zone and to lean into the calling that you have placed on each of our lives. And God, we want to give you access to the inner parts of our lives that we have not given you access to before. Anger, bitterness, fear, um, vengeance, anything, God, that's keeping us from being able to love ourselves better, love you more, and love others the way they need to, help us. Forgive us. We repent of our sins, and we ask you, God, to renew our relationship with you. We thank you in advance. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Uh, amen. Amen. Listen, I think next week we talk about um, what it looks like to be a disciple or something like that. If you're in our, if you're in our um, mailing list, I will uh, mail, email you the reading list for uh, what we need to read for next week. But next week is going to be powerful because we got to take a turn because I want to help you. I think I think it's um, it is the past the same passage, but the Bible says they didn't believe that Paul was a disciple, and so I want to dig into what does that look like for us? Because in twenty three years of preaching and in seventeen and fifteen, you know, I never really was taught, you know, like what are some attributes that need to be that I need to seek after? What does it mean to be a disciple maker? Like, what does that look like? How do I fulfill that part of my assignment as a believer? I, it's more than going to church. It's more than being a part of a life group. It's more than, you know, going to Bible study. That's all feeding me. But if Jesus says, go into all of the world and make disciples, then what part of that command in that great commission why am I not being taught that? And it's not just mentoring. Jesus didn't mentor anybody one-on-one. -on -one. He discipled people for long periods of time. But what does that look like? How do I know that I am and what do I need to do so that I can become? I want to be the one that helps you with that because I struggled silently for years, not really knowing what that looked like as a preacher, pastor, because nobody ever walked me through that. Nobody ever had discipled me up until that point. So I just didn't know. And we're not talking about mentoring. That's the easy way. That's not disciple. That's not discipling. But there are some things that we need to walk through and look at um, that's a part of this book that we can see. And I think we're supposed to look at, at Philip at his life because we're going to see it. We can see some of the attributes in Philip's life. So we're going to look at that and some other things. But Saturday mornings, um, as much as you want to sleep in, you're asking God for more. You want God to increase. You want God then tell you what show up because that's a space where we get to grow and we get to ask questions. And we get to talk. So Saturday morning, we'll dive into Ephesians and dive in more into the nuances of what we just talked about. Um, but we appreciate your time, your patience uh, in the comment section. I know you all are putting some things in the comment section. I can't quite see. Um, hey, listen, listen. Um, and, and one of my one of my. My, my good guys, um, Scott, you know, um, discipling him years ago. And I think the powerful thing that I get to see with Scott is that I've seen him intentionally with groups of people over the years, literally take time out of his life to walk with them, right? And to disciple them. And it's a powerful thing because 
Um, discipling takes time and it takes your life, you know, and that's what Jesus did to the disciples. And the problem is we express church, we move quick, and we don't really get that depthness of relationship with people. And so one thing about this ministry, my wife and I were committed to um, doing what's hard to do. And so it's not popular, but it's necessary because I promise once as we do that, you know, I don't, you know, people like Scott and people, other people I've discipled, you know, they do what Paul and Timothy and, um, you know, so many other of those disciples, Eutychus, so many, uh, you know, they move on and they continue to build people and love people and develop people and move into who God has called them to be. So listen, um, I appreciate you all. I'm looking forward to walking with you. Um, and um, we love you all. We definitely love you. Um, everybody, we appreciate you. Um, I just say doing life, doing life with people requires you to slow down. Right. And it requires you to give them what Jesus Jesus didn't have this template more than he his life is a template. But they saw him. They saw Jesus get upset. They saw him cry. They saw him happy. They saw him tired. And he they saw so much of him. They saw the real life of him. And so many times we have leaders and people in pulpits and and other parts of the church who we never really get to see that. So we don't know that that's a part of the life that God has called us, like it's naturally part of it. And so um, I'm looking forward to the next two weeks because I think we're going to deal with um, four chair discipleship. So one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you, I'm going to give you an assignment that I'm going to ask everybody to take this assessment. And this assessment is going to help you to discover where you are in this spiritual growth dynamic uh, dimension. Right. And so we don't do a good job as a church of helping people to assess where they really are, not where they want to be, but where they really are. And so I want to help you with so many different things, which it means that you need to be present on Saturday as well. All right, y'all. We love you. We appreciate you all. Y'all have a good day now. Peace.